always send them to me. Hi, Ryan, it's Grant Abbott speaking. Um, again, if you've got any issues, please uh, send any technical questions. This is quite a technical session to grant at ilovebusinessf.com. And of course, you can always call our number 1300 168 380. Uh, 1300 168 um, 380. And uh, good to see you back, Geraldine, after your recent sickness. So it's great. Okay, so 1322C trusts, I've been talking about them since, oh gosh, the, the 90s, after the elimination of related trusts um, in 1999, um, which was predicated in the announcement in May uh, 1998 about related trusts becoming part of in-house assets. Now, I want to take you through um, a lot of strategies um, or a few strategies around this. But what I need to do first is actually get us um, all into the zone of having a look at the legislation and me explaining it, which is typically the place is look at the law, um, discuss the law, and then apply the law inside a case study. Um, I had a chat with Ash the other day, and she was saying that, you know, uh, people prefer to have talking heads rather than case studies uh, because it's hard to apply case studies to real facts. Well, on the reverse, um, I was always taught um, the Harvard Law School method, which is like a tutorial, is make sure that you uh, look at a case study to apply. And if you have a look at cases anyway, they are cases, case studies by their very nature. Um, and then we can see how they apply to our particular client circumstances. So I've got a little case study for us at the end, um, which will actually bring everything together. Um, so the, the key things that we're going to look at is uh, related trusts are basically not allowed under the in-house asset rules. Um, that was brought in in 1999. There is an exception to the rule, which we're going to have a look at, found in Section 71.1J. Um, there is also that exception, which is really bizarre because um, unless it's a widely held unit trust, um, a, a S or a listed unit trust, an SMSF can't acquire an asset from a related party, such as a member, uh, family trust, uh, controls, or alternatively a company. But there's an exception for a 1322C trust. So we're gonna to have to find out what, what, what this package of 1322C looks like. Uh, we're gonna track through the laws. I'm gonna look at uh, the ins and outs plus uh, disqualifications in 1322D. Um, so you might have a 1322CD, but if something happens, it immediately turns into, um, it loses its favoured status under 1322D, which would mean that you've then got to obviously make a plan to dispose um, of those units when the period of time I'll talk about it. Um, I want to look at uh, an issue of an, a family trust in SMSF buying a $400,000 residential property uh, with $300,000 in the family trust using cash and borrowings and then just using $50,000 from the SMSF. And over time, um, the uh, units in the family trust being transferred to the SMSF by way of contribution or transfer, or alternatively, even looking at doing it under an LRBA. So those of you remember our automated strategy, uh, our strategy automation for uh, LRBAs, uh, which um, meet the conditions guidelines of uh, PCG 2016 five, uh, we can apply them to units. So we're going to look at that. Um, I'm going to then go back and have a look at this diagram and, and go through that. Uh, but at this present point in time, let's go in and have a look at the legislation, which is important. Um, this is uh, being recorded, obviously, so we'll be able to have a look at it um, later. So I'm looking at uh, Section 84. So this is the uh, basically penalty provisions of the in-house assets test. And Section 84 says in-house asset rules must be complied with. Um, each trustee regulated super fund must take all reasonable steps to ensure the provisions of Division 2 and Division 3 or 3A, uh, which we'll get, are complied with. Um, so if we then go down this, there's actually two sections that are relevant here, and I, I raise this mainly for a 1322C um, issue. The first one is um, under Section 83, which we will get to. Um, so this section applies to regulated super fund. Um, so there's two, section 8283. If the market value ratio of the fund's in-house assets exceeds 5%, a trustee of the fund must not acquire an in-house asset. So effectively there. If the market rate ratio, market value ratio of the fund's in-house assets does not exceed 5%, a trustee of the fund must not acquire an in-house asset 
if the acquisition would result in the market value ratio of the fund's in-house assets exceeding 5%. Uh, for the avoidance of doubt, a reference in the section to acquiring an in-house asset includes reference to making an investment or a loan or entering into a lease or lease arrangement if the resulting loan or investment or the asset subject to the lease or lease arrangement would be an in-house asset. Um, so, uh, for example, um, we may well have business real property, uh, which we then convert to residential property. So business real property uh, would be excluded. Uh, but as soon as we have residential property, um, if it's leased back to ourselves, we suddenly find that we've got a brand new in-house asset because it's subject to a, a lease arrangement. Um, this is probably a more important one that we have a look at. Um, this section applies to regulated fund. If the market value ratio of the fund's in-house assets um, at the end of a later year of income, because obviously 2000, 2001 is a late time, exceeds 5%, the trustee of the fund, or if the fund has a group of individual trustees, must prepare a written plan. So at the end of the year, 30 June, uh, let's say 30 June 2019, we found that our existing in-house assets in the fund um, effectively exceeded 5%. Then what happens is the trustee must put in place a plan. So the plan must specify the amount, that's the excess amount worked out using the formula, look at the market value ratio of the funds minus 5%. So let's say it's 10% minus five, that's 5% times the whole value of the funds assets at the end of the year of income. So that's the excess amount. So if the whole value of the funds assets are a million and our excess amount is 5%, that's $50,000. Does that, that sort of make sense? So then the plan, so what we have to do is a plan um, has to be put in place um, and says the plan must set out the steps which the trustee proposes or if the fund has a group of individual trustees, the trustees propose to take in order to ensure that one or more of the fund's in-house assets held at the end of that year of income, so it's not going to be 30 June 2019, it's going to be 30 June, um, it's 30 June 2019, um, are disposed of during the next following year of income. So we have to work out um, if it's that $50,000 of in-house assets, we have to then dispose of them uh, by 30 June uh, 2000 and, uh, 2020. So um, if our units have actually gone up in price, so they've doubled in price, we still only have to dispose of $50,000 of units. If they've gone down in price, it's still 50. So the number of units that we dispose of is going to be equated. And you can actually use this to quite a good extent. Um, and the value of that is so disposed equal to or more than the excess amount. Now, the plan must be prepared before the end of the next following year of income, and each trustee of the fund must ensure the steps in the plan are carried out. So if we inadvertently go above or try to go from a 1322C to 1322D, then effectively we're caught in here, and we have to um, effectively be in a position of um, uh, ameliorating ourselves of um, Section 82. So let's go back to Section 71 and find out what an in-house asset is. Uh, so if we go down and we have a look um, here, and uh, I'm in the SISAC because I know Ian likes to uh, follow me here. And, and again, this has been recorded, so if you want to come back later, it is a bit of a technical one, but just the way it is with this. So section one, meaning of in-house asset. For the purpose of this part, an in-house asset of a superannuation fund is an asset of the fund that is a loan to or an investment in a related party of the fund. An investment, this is where we're going, an investment in a related trust um, of the fund or an asset of the fund subject to a lease or lease arrangement. So a related trust is where uh, myself, any other entity I control, family trust, uh, relatives, uh, family companies, anything that, that I really control, um, it doesn't matter where it is, it's wholly owned. So when I get down a little bit later on um, and look at this here, all the units in this trust are wholly owned by a group that are all related. Therefore, it's classified as a related trust of the SMSF. Even though the SMSF might only have $50,000 and the family trust $350,000, we group them all. So it's $400,000 of 400,000 on issue. And it means that it's a related trust. So um, prima facie, which just means at the outset, um, effectively what we've got is a, a breach. If we started this off, be clearly a breach of section 83. Does that make sense? Because it's not an in-house asset, 
it's section 83 and therefore 84 would apply in that instance and we'd have to pay a, a relative fine and probably obviously divest ourselves. Now there are some exclusions, see, but all of these, the related uh, trust is quarters in houses, but does not include, and I'm going too fast, please let me let me know. Um, a couple of things here. Um, uh, if the super fund has fewer than five members, real property subject to a lease or lease arrangement enforceable by legal proceedings. So if you're using a um, commercial, our commercial lease on our, like your docs between a trustee of the fund and a related party of the fund, if throughout the term of the lease, lease arrangement of the property is business real property. So you can have like a commercial lease between a family trust or a member or so on and so forth, um, if you want to do that. Um, where we want to do is go down to here, um, subsection J or sub um, section J, an asset included in a class of assets specified in the regulations not to be in-house assets of any fund or not to be in-house assets of a class of funds to which the fund belongs. For this purpose, a class of assets may consist of, but is not included to assets that are investments and entities that undertake or do not undertake specified activities. So what I need to do is go to the regulations um, and I'm in division 13.2, which is a various operating standards. So I've gone from the Act, uh, which is 71.1J, and I'm now going to the CIS regs. Um, so with the CIS regs, um, we go down to um, 13.22C and I'll just uh, take us through line by line on this one. And uh, we will be building it um, on the Lightyear Docs site. It was only put up this morning, but um, let me just go through here. So we go, sole purpose test, 65. Uh, investment collectibles, we don't want that one. So sorry about scrolling, but anyway, I'm sure you're gonna be quite happy when we get there. Okay, so 1322A, business real property. B, we don't worry about it because that's not one. 1322C. So assets acquired after the commencement of um, Division 13.3A. This regulation applies to an asset of a superannuation fund that is an investment in a company or unit trust. Um, so we do, I'm, I'm not sure whether, I'll have a look later, but we do have a 1322C company waiting in the wings. I'm not sure if it's actually up on our site and was acquired by the fund on or after the commencement of this division and is not affected by 1322D3. So we're gonna go through 1322C, then we'll go to 1322D3, which will then have an impact. So can you see the link here? Two, for par subparagraph 71.1J2 of the Act, um, which is there, it's not to be an in-house asset um, of a class of funds. So this is the commissioner's thing. The asset is not an in-house asset of the super fund if when the asset is acquired, the super fund has fewer than five members. So it's specifically excluded for SMSFs. So this is a specific exclusion. Ordinarily, if I can say this, is that I'll take you back here. If this was a superannuation unrelated investment trust where you and I put 50% of our assets um, or our SMSFs in there, much like our licensing trust for Lightyear Docs, in that instance, because there's two parties, neither of us control, it's not a related trust, the CIS Act cannot prescribe what can be involved um, in terms of the undergoing business and operations of the trust. Does that make sense? Whereas here, because we've got 1322C trust, it's an exception to the in-house asset rules and a very important exception, the um, laws actually go in and look at a limitation or put prescriptions around what that trust can and cannot do. It's the only time that this prescription built in the CIS legislation and regulations that enables um, the government to actually prescribe what can and can't be done because it's an exception to the rule. So first off, fewer than five members, the company or trustee of the, of the unit trust is not a party to a lease with a related party of the super fund unless the lease relates to business real property and the company is, or transfer of the unit trust is not party to a lease arrangement with a related party of the super fund 
unless the lease arrangement is legally, legally binding and relates to business real property. So that if we go back here and we look at having a property in here, we could have residential property in that trust. Um, we will, and I'm going to be looking at that. We can have residential property in that trust. We can have rural property in that trust. We can have commercial and industrial property in that trust. However, we cannot then lease that to a related party. We can lease it to an unrelated party, of course, but we can't release it to a related party unless it is, let's go back, unless it is business real property. Does that make sense? So unless it's business real property, we cannot um, lease it back. But we can, if it's residential, we can lease it to an independent third party. Uh, we won't do this, it's just back to back. Um, e is an important one. The company or a trustee of the unit trust does not have outstanding borrowings. We might as well highlight that. So it doesn't have any outstanding borrowings. So you've got to be very careful, no overdrafts, et cetera, um, in relation to this. Mm. In fact, this is not a bad vehicle. Um, you can, you know, we'll, we'll have a look at it anyway. The assets of the company or unit trust do not include an interest in another entity. So it can't include shares, units in a unit trust or any interest in another entity. So effectively that means we can have, we can have things in there, not bits of things like, for example, units, etc. So we can have things like a property, residential, commercial, all those are things. We could have artwork here. You'll find the collectibles applies directly at the SMSF level, but doesn't apply at this trust level. We can have vintage cars, but again, remember those things can't be leased um, back or be utilised by a member or related party um, if it's, uh, it's not business real property. So essentially we've got a lot of things in there. Um, so it doesn't include an entity um, or a loan to another entity unless the loan is a deposit with an authorised deposit um, taking institution. For example, you could have a, um, uh, you could have, for example, a term deposit sitting there. Um, an asset over or in relation to which there is a charge. And I'm going to come back and have a look at that a little bit later on. So you can't have a mortgage over any of the assets or any other charges. Um, so uh, an asset was acquired from a rate of part of the super fund after, unless the asset was acquired, was um, business real property acquired um, at market value. Um, so again, uh, we've just, we can acquire business. If we go back here, if we've got a family trust that owns business real property, we can flip the business real property up to the CIS regulation 1322C trust. And in consideration, the family trust will receive um, let's say it's 400,000, 350, and then we can give uh, 50,000 to the SMSF, which would be treated as a contribution. Does that make sense? So we can flip the property up there, and then we can go through this process. But again, if we've got the property up there, we can't use it as borrowings. But I will look at maybe doing LRBAs over these units in the trust a little bit later on. Anyway, back to the legislation. Um, the asset would do that, an asset that had been at the time, so we don't have to worry about that one. So in subparagraphs 2, if it does not include money or in relation to a company, a share in a company. So obviously we can acquire assets if it's company. Um, now 1322D, so if regulation 1322C applies to an asset, the regulation ceases to apply the asset if any of the following events happens. You get more um, than five members. Um, Either of, either of the fine becomes an asset of the company, an interest in another entity or a loan. The company or trustee or unit trust borrows money or gives a charge, which is importantly. Um, here, the company or trustee uh, conducts a business. Um, again, if we just go down um, all of these ones here, um, there's quite a, a lot there, but look, it just makes sense. Um, if remember talked about in 1322C, if regulation 1322 ceases to apply to an asset of a super fund, Neither regulation applies to any other asset of the fund that is acquired by the fund at that time or any interest of the thing at that time. 
So that's essentially where we are with 1322C or D. Uh, we effectively can um, have a, a problem there. So let's go down and um, have a look at uh, this scenario. So we've got a, um, we've got a, a, a residential property um, that's sitting in the CIS Regulation 1322C Trust. So the family trust subscribes for $350,000 of units in the 1322C Trust. The SMSF subscribes for 50,000 units in the um, trust. Now, the family trust has borrowings um, or has a, a loan from a bank or another entity that it uses in order to fund those units. Now, a couple of things. One is um, it could be residential or any property. Um, it couldn't be a real estate investment trust or REIT because that would be an interest in an entity. Does that make sense? Um, we can't put a charge. So if the family trust is doing a borrowing at this level, we can't put a charge on the underlying assets. If we do, then 1322CD, uh, sorry, 1322D kicks in, and then we're going to have to um, go down the track of writing a plan. Remember, we had to write a plan under Section 82 and all of those sort of things as well. Now, what I want to do is just go through uh, one more section of the legislation. So if there's any questions on that, just let me know. It's pretty... Um, Pretty easy to understand if you have a look at uh, my perspective. Um, if we then go down uh, to, and there are quite a few commissioners' rulings on this, uh, believe it or not. If we then go not to the regulations, we go to section 66, um, and section 66 deals with the acquisition of assets uh, from a related party. And I just want to show you how these link in. Oops, sorry. So, victimization of trustees, that's pretty good to know about in terms of divorce. Um, 67, we know about LRBAs, that's okay. And then we get to uh, section 67, and then we get to section six is where we want to go. Make sure all of you have, um, obviously, uh, these are great sessions, but make sure all of you have... Um, uh, registered for the upcoming road show. It's going to be a pretty special one. I will be talking about um, uh, this particular case study there, but not to any great extent. So subject to subsection two, section 66, acquisition of certain assets from members of regulated um, superannuation funds. Um, so if we have a look there, subject to subsection two, a trustee or investment manager of a regulated super fund must not intentionally acquire an asset from a related party. So if I go back to here, um, we can't, the SMSF can't acquire those units from that family trust. Um, exception is business real property and listed securities. You can't do that. Um, exception, let's have a look here. Subsection 2A, subsection 1 does not prohibit the acquisition of an asset by a trustee of a superannuation fund from a related party if the acquisition of the asset constitutes an investment that is an in-house asset of the fund within the meaning of Section 71 um, and would be an in-house asset of the fund within uh, the meaning of subsection 1, apart from the operation of this, um, and, and the assets acquired at market value um, and the acquisition of the asset would not result in the level of in-house assets the super fund exceeding the level permitted, which is 5%. Um, so if we have a look here, it's um, the acquisition... Is, uh, is an in-house asset within the meaning of 71 or would be an asset of the fund or is a life insurance or um, is referred to in paragraph 71.1J. Remember that? Um, and then the assets acquired at market value, which is important, and the acquisition of the asset would not result in the level of in-house assets um, of the super. So it's actually exclusion from the in-house assets um, so subsection C doesn't apply. So in effect, what it means here is when I show you there, we can put in a residential property there. So if I'm applying this in a case study, a residential property could go in there. Um, the family trust, remember, borrows but can't charge the unit. If it does, then we're back into section 82. We have to pair a pan for the following year about how to dispose of those units that are in excess, um, which would actually be a whole lot of them. We then go through the, the process that 
the family trust can contribute um, or sell to the SMSF um, their underlying $350,000 of units. So let me just go to um, the site and show you what it looks like and where to find it. So I'm just in uh, the Lightyear Docs site. And again, uh, for those of you, I'm on uh, obviously on an unlimited plan. So if you're on a license, um, you can do as many of these as you want. If you are on a LY strategist, which is um, amount of payment per month, again, it's unlimited. Otherwise, if we go into the product categories, um, I'll go down and you'll find here, it's in trusts. Um, and then you've got your 1322C related unit trust. Um, and that costs $99 um, there. So it's a pretty good deal for a specialist trust. Um, I did one a little bit while before just to save us time. Um, so and I put it into my folder. Remember, these are all the, the folders that you have. And I put it in under the Abbott family folder. So to open that, I just click on that button. Oops, sorry, cancel. So it's my one. I click on the left-hand side. Um, so you can there, the 1322C related trust. When I click on the plus sign, you can see there I, my document reference number, 101134. Um, it was done at 922, so only a little while ago. Now I can download that, um, or alternatively I can bin it or see the rocket, I can relaunch it. So I'm gonna relaunch it, and uh, this is where we uh, basically uh, jumps in. And um, so I've got the, the one, I'll just go through the, the whole thing. So. I've called it the Smith 1322C Trust. I like to put the 1322C in there because otherwise the auditors just freak out. But the, the auditors will not understand or just assume this is a related trust. And if you are doing one of these, you are going to have to take the auditor um, through the relevant laws or better still, um, take them through our support centre. So when you get the support centre, um, you'll find here a lot of client documents, advice, webinars and how-to videos. So this uh, video will be up there. Um, you'll see it'll be a strategy webinar. Uh, so um, just direct the uh, direct our order to that. So 1322C Trust, New South Wales. I don't know the exact date that I'm going to sign it, so I can leave it blank and insert that a little bit later on. I then go to the next, um, and then what we do is, uh, well, who are the initial unit holders? So I've got the trust, the family trust, um, and I'll just put in, remember, I did 350, and I need to work out the unit price. I mean, I could do $10,000 units, but it's better to do 350, particularly if I'm transferring them in. So I've got uh, dollar units, um, and remember, I'm gonna be contributing or selling these in. Uh, what's the full name of the trust? I've got that, um, I've got one individual, there as the trustee. Uh, I can put in another one or can company, but I'm just saving time here. So now we've got the uh, first uh, unit holder. And what I would do is I'd go then to the next one, which is, um, so I can add as many unit holders as I want. It doesn't matter, remember these are all related. So I'm going to put in the SMSF. Remember I said it's 50,000. Now obviously they're the dollar units. Um, and if you haven't got the cash, um, I've done a few of these recently, you can do partly paid units. So for example, I could do, I could put in $5,000 and still get $50,000, but they're 50,000 units, but they're partly paid to that. So I've got the Smith Family Super Fund, you can see there, I've got a company, um, SMSF, um, Smith SMSF nominees, two directors, John Smith, um, Judy Smith. So that's all okay. So the next line that I have to go down to is the trustee of the unit trust. Um, so what I've done is um, I've just simply done individuals here. So please have the details of the trustee for the related trust. Individual, um, John Smith here. Um, and then you can see there I've got Judy Smith as the next one. Um, and she's the trustee. And remember this is just a relaunch. I then go to the next and we get to the signers there. So they're all the parties that are signing. And we just simply finish. And that will then take us to the document itself. So just it's taking a little while, mainly because I've had to relaunch it. So 
Um, I just download the document. You can see here is the PDF um, there. That pops up and now I've got a superannuation CIS 1322C uh, related investment trustee. So you've got all the normal disclaimers. Um, you've got there the Smith 1322C. The initial unit holders are John Smith as trustee for the Smith Family Trust. John and Judy Smith as directors of Smith nominees as trustee for the Smith Family Super Fund. Um, we've also got, uh, I like bringing in the unit holders uh, because they actually have to sign up to the deed. Uh, the trustee, we've got John and Judy Smith as trustee for the Smith 1322C Trust. So that was all the, the stuff we filled in. So the rest of the tiles, uh, the initial unit holders pay the initial amount to the trustee to establish a trust on the terms of this deed. The trustee has agreed to act as trustee and hold all monies. Provision this deed to apply to bind the unit holders and also to benefit them, which is why I want to sign off. The unit holders may include trustees of self-managed super fund or related party as the intent of the unit holders to enable the unit trust to be considered as a related trust as that term is defined under CIS 3. So this is why it's a special purpose. Obviously, you wouldn't do that with any um, other unit trust. We then go down and we find there um, the initial amount is the $400,000 paid by the initial unit holders. Um, it's not a plural there, mainly because um, in, in a deed, plural includes singular as well as plural. Uh, we've got all the super laws, self-managed super fund. Uh, we then go down and have a look at, um, again, these are all the interpretations. Governing law is New South Wales. Um, you've just got to be careful if you've got this in New South Wales, it's a unit trust. Um, South Australia and others, but this one you'll have to get it stamped in New South Wales um, and also stamped in, um, in Victoria. And I think we've got a, we'll be putting something up on a support centre as to where and what documents need to be stamped, but definitely this one needs to be stamped. If we then go through the, the process um, down here. Uh, we've got the units, 350, 50, 350,000 units, 50. As I said, they can, um, again, be partly paid. We've got all the beneficial interests of the unit holders, um, what happens on death, um, so on and so forth. Um, so you can read through all of that um, if you uh, want to. Uh, it's quite a long document, uh, but it's got all the nuts and bolts there. Um, and then we execute it uh, by the unit holders. So it's the trust. Um, where there's individuals witnessed, and then the Smith Family SMSF, and then the Unrelated Investment Trust. So that's essentially the guts of the uh, document we've got there. Um, one other thing that we could do, and I might just jump in, I wonder if I've got it. Have I got it, have I got it, have I got it, have I got it? No, it doesn't look as though I've got it here. Okay, no, I don't think I've done it. Um, what we could do is, um, so essentially that allows me to, that allows me to go ahead and do this um, again. So I've done that, the 350, 50 in there. We know the conditions, no mortgage, no borrowing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now the family trust could contribute um, those uh, units to the SMSF. And if it's a contribution, what I would suggest is um, depending on the age, if the client is 60 or whatever, then just simply contribute or the SMSF can actually buy them um, off the family trust. Um, alternatively, the only thing we, another thing we can do is if we go into product categories, you'll find in our strategy automation um, here, which is going to get bigger and bigger all the time, We've got related party property meeting ATO guidelines, upgrades, and here we've got the shares. So I can start the document. It's quite a, a, a big document. So because it's got so many uh, processes, uh, when it goes green, you can flick it on. So I'm going through here. Let me just take you through what we're looking at. So let's have a look at the, it's the Smith Family SMSF company. Um, we are integrating with I think the Smith uh, nominees. Again, I'll, I'd have to go and get the other data, but um, we will be integrating with class 
and also BGL very shortly, which will be great. So Fire Smith Street, uh, Sydney. Does anyone know what I'm about to do? So how many directors? Um, I think we had two plus, uh, which was, if I remember correctly, confirm. So it was uh, John Smith. Tab, and then we go Judy Smith. Click, we must always click, see that, in order to, to sign, otherwise they don't turn up as signers. Okay, so um, we'll leave that blank. We don't know where it is. Who attended the meeting? John and Judy Smith, who's the chairperson? Uh, John Smith, where's the meeting held at? Well, we just select the other one. So we know it's at 5 Smith Street. So I'm presuming that's your offices. Uh, we then go down to the name of the holding trust. So let's go CIS. Now this isn't a CIS holding trust. Oops, sorry, CIS. Come to the holding trust, but it's there to hold the units. I don't know what it is. We'll just go the individual. We'll go John Smith. If we go down here. Um, I don't think I've got the select button. So we go same thing. Five Smith Street, Sydney, New South Wales. Two oh oh. So that's setting up the holding trust, which is okay. So the trustee meeting, again, um, John Smith is the only one, is the only one. We do a select. As you can see, this is quite a sophisticated when we're, when you think of all the documents that's actually being pumped out. Um, so we go down, we select. Okay, so the next one is the loan. Um, so who's a related party lender? It's going to be the trustee of the trust. So let's remember, it's the Smith Family Trust. Oops. The trustee's an individual. Remember, it was, uh, we only just did um, John Smith for this one. It wasn't John and Judy. Uh, five Smith Street. You guys are going to love our new estate planning, which will only be, it should be no more than uh, this sort of length. Okay, so the number of shares or units. So it's going to be, for example, let's go uh, 100,000 units in the Smith 13. Dot 22C unit related unit trust. I think that was the name of it. So the consideration uh, for that is going to be 100,000. Now consideration may include, um, so for example, the loan amount, because we can go 50%, um, the loan amount, we've got 100,000. Um, so it's going to be 50% contribution, 50% loan amount. Is everyone with me on that one? Um, seven years, 7.9% is the commissioner's guidelines. Now, the only thing is the commissioner's guidelines don't necessarily apply to um, private unit trusts like this, uh, but at least if you go down this track, it should be. Um, is the loan uh, variable? Um, pick New South Wales. Um, and then we look at what our repayments are. Remember, they have to be uh, principal and interest. So let's say it is over seven years. Let's say it is um, seven hundred dollars per month. I'd, I'd have to work out, but you know, when the loan agreement mortgage deed be dated, um, let's leave that blank because we're not quite sure. And that's it. So I'd be doing both of those processes. As you can see, I've done that in what, about 15 minutes, uh, both the 1322C trust um, and now the LIBA. Now, obviously the LIBA, you do it a little bit later on. So up at Pops, so related party LIBA establishment uh, pack for shares and units. 
Um, so it goes through, these are all the documents we've got there with it. Um, I won't spend all the time in there, but you've got the um, commissioner's guidance there. You've got the borrowing arrangement. So that's the Minister the Trustee, the Smith Family Fund, um, wanting to set it up. And you've got the holding trust. You've got the limited recourse and borrowing arrangement for the 1322C holding trust. You've got the related party loan agreement. And then you've got the mortgage deed, which is over those units as well. Um, so as you can see there, that's a, a application of a strategy if we wanted to go down there. The reason I'd probably apply that one in this instance um, is that uh, if we are going from the family trust, the SMSF, if the client is only 40 or 45, 50 or 35, by doing at least a loan, it means that the 100,000 went over there. Obviously, 50,000 is stuck in there. Uh, but then what we've got is uh, a loan. So the family trust can always uh, go back to the SMSF and require repayment of the loan. Anyway, that's, uh, that's about it. Um, just a couple of other things. Um, make sure that you make it to our roadshow um, coming up in, um, let's say if you're in Perth. Uh, Perth is the 18th, 15th of October, so it's not that far away. All of you guys, if you want to go to the roadshow, just book in there. Um, I'm just trying to show you which one to do. So that's a Perth roadshow. Um, have a look at the agenda, it's going to be absolutely awesome, but you'll be pumping out these strategies. So just make sure you go, I love SMSF member and like your docs users. So that's $145. So make sure you um, get into that. It's going to be a great road show. We've already got 150 people coming along um, and uh, it's going to be fairly intensive. So it's not going to be a big, um, uh, a really big one, but what I'm going to do is take you through a lot of strategies and wait until you see all our estate planning, which includes a wills testamentary trust, a brand new thing for you. It's called an SMSF testamentary trust, which comes from an SMSF, a binding death benefit directions, order of reversion pensions, family allowances, dependent um, or dependency uh, declaration. We're also going to look at upgrading our uh, family trust to put in place um, succession planning uh, through appointing tools like leading members. But we're looking at leading members. Um, so all of that is going to be pretty full on, but I'll show you how to build all those uh, while we go through the strategies. Anyway, uh, that's enough for me. Um, what I'll do is if there's any questions, uh, again, just send them through to Granted I Love SMSF. As I said, it's mainly for property. Um, it fits in here really well, uh, but the, the benefit to me is we don't need to buy everything for an SMSF because we can have borrowing. Um, I have seen instances where a 1322C trust then gets into a joint venture with a development company to develop the property. So that shows you how far we can um, take it on from here. Anyway, it's Grant Abbott uh, signing off and thank you all for attending the session and it will be up on the site um, very, very shortly. So probably in about maybe a couple of hours. It's Grant Abbott signing off. <laughs>